Hello overclockers, I'm 8-Pack, jack of all trades and master of every single one of them. One of those is of course, PC hardware and overclocking, where I'm head of R&D here at Overclockers UK. In this video, we're gonna discuss the new AMD 9060 XT 16GB graphics card. And through the video, we're gonna cover about the stock performance, the overclock performance, and the offset voltage performance. We're also gonna cover power draw, given each of those conditions, and about the cooling of the card and PSU requirements through my Benchwork suite. So, if you wanna find out accurate information on all this stuff, that's far better than anything else you'll find on YouTube, continue to watch. That being said, let's get into it. So, in this video, I'm going to be looking at the 9060 XT Pure Card by Sapphire that I have on the desk here next to me. This card, and indeed all 9060 XT cards, are AMD RDNA 4 architecture. The GPU boost clock on this card is up to 3290 MHz at advertised, and the GPU game clock on this card is up to 2700 MHz as advertised. The stream processors in all 9060XT cards is 2048, and the ray accelerators on all 9060XT cards is 32. The VRAM on this particular uh, version that I've got next to me is 16 gigabyte, and this amount of memory I would suggest is aimed squarely at very high-end 1080p gaming or 1440p gaming. This card also comes in an eight gigabyte variation, with eight gigabit being more aimed uh, squarely at 1080p or 1440p if you want to run at low to medium settings as your particular maximum. So that being said uh, about this 9060XT Pure Card by Sapphire, now let's look a little bit about the cooler design before we move on to talk about any benchmarking results. So the design of the card here, as you can see, it's approximately 2.2, 2.3 slots in width. It's not a very heavy card particularly, but that's probably because of the diminutive stature of the PCB, which you can see is only up to here on the card. So it's only taking up approximately three quarters of the cooler length. The uh, outputs on the card, it's got two HDMI ports and it's got uh, one display port. So uh, that's your connectivity on the card. As far as power in the card goes, it takes one conventional PCI Express connector only to run the card which is fine because the power uh, draw of the particular card, as you'll see in the benchmarking, is reasonably low. Now, obviously this card, as you'll see from uh, the benchmarks, the cooler is more than adequate to cool the card, and the noise level from these two fans is low at all times, even if you actually force the fans to maximum, it's still pretty low and lower than the AIO that I was using for the testing. This card, obviously, being uh, white in design would fit into any white builds or any monochrome builds, or even I suppose any black builds where you want the graphics cards to stand out. And in that category, it fits pretty well. As far as the backplate goes, we've got the standard full length backplate here to add rigidity to the PCB. And we've also got um, an ARGB output connector here, which you can quite easily sync with your motherboard and other software so that the RGB on the card, which is mainly the logo up here, can sync with the rest of your system. So, as far as I'm concerned, the look of this card is certainly functional and the cooler is, is very functional and it's going to fit nicely into the type of systems that I've described. So that's been said about the look of the card uh, and a bit about the cooler aesthetics, etc. and the dimensions of the PCB. Now let's move on to the test bench that I used to test this card out. So, the test bench that I used for this graphics card is exactly the same testing hardware that I've used consistently since the latest GPUs came out from both red and green team. So I'm using an Intel Core 285K CPU, uh, which is overclocked to 5.7 gigahertz on all the performance cores. Uh, the memory is 32 gig of G-Skill memory, all the way at 8,400 megahertz. Uh, I'm using the eight pack PSU, which is uh, OEM by Superflower, and I've been using that for six, seven, or even eight years uh, with no problems whatsoever. And the motherboard, is the Z890 Asus Extreme uh, board. Obviously, this makes sure that we've got very good power to both the card and the PCI Express uh, slot, etc., to get good power delivery to max out the card. 
A lot of people do ask why don't you use AMD CPUs uh, for AMD cards and vice versa, all these kind of questions. And the main reason is for consistency throughout graphics testing. Once I pick a platform for a specific generation of graphics cards, then I keep to that platform no matter what card I'm testing. But I can obviously at this point uh, recommend uh, the AMD CPUs that I have already reviewed, uh, which are pretty much all the 3D cache CPUs and all the uh, 9 series AMD CPUs will also work very well with this uh, GPU, uh, as will in fact all the 3D cache models which will suit its gaming prowess. The drivers that I used for this benchmarks were the ones that were sent to me uh, via AMD. So quite an early driver and by the time you actually get this video there might be updated drivers with maybe more functionality if that's at all possible uh, or even more uh, gaming optimizations that, that maybe weren't involved in the drivers that I had. But I can report the drivers I had did work uh, fine throughout the duration of testing that I uh, used them for. I also obviously ran Windows 11 uh, with the latest updates already applied uh, to the drive again to get the best optimizations for the card. I also updated my benchmarking suites to the latest versions, for example, uh, 3D Mark, etc. So they were reporting the right card was plugged into the slot, etc. Now, what were the results when you put this card through my uh, extensive suite of benchmarks that I chose myself? Uh, and didn't take any input from any viewers of this channel. At stock, the peak frequency of this card was a massive 3,436 megahertz, which was 150 to 200 megahertz more than the advertised frequency, which is very solid. Uh, the memory was a constant 2,500 megahertz, no matter what you did, but then again, I wasn't trying to overclock or tune the memory. The power draw of the card was 188 watts, which is pretty low power draw. The temperature uh, of the GPU uh, maxed out at 57 degrees C, with the hotspot maxing out at 86 degrees C, with the fan noise and the fan profile on absolute stock, and there was no problem whatsoever with noise. There was no problem whatsoever with temperatures, given all these settings. So I'm pleased to say that this card had very low power draw, certainly given the frequency boost that it was gaining above what you've actually paid for, you know? What's been paid for is 3290 consistent, and what we've got here is 3436 consistent. So a very solid uh, result overall. So, but obviously, I'm 8-pack, I'm the king of overclocking. So I thought I'd better at least do some overclocking. So, to over that clock this card, I used the uh, built-in functionality in the AMD driver, which I'm pleased to report, as I said earlier, everything was working well, and so was the overclocking, and all reporting to do with the overclocking in that section. And how I overclocked this card initially for just overclocking was I increased the core frequency by up to 200 megahertz. I also increased the memory frequency accordingly. I increased the fan speed to maxed out. I increased the power limit to maxed out. And then I tested the stability of the card by running Port Royal on 4K uh, for around an hour. And I also running other 3D Mark stability benches uh, of both Time Spy and Fire Strike Extreme to further check stability. What I can report is that we, we did manage to overclock this card nicely, but it didn't really respond to increases in voltage to, to gain more stability from overclocking the core. What we did also see was a very, very slight increase of two or three watts by overclocking the card. So not much at all and something that's not even statistically uh, relevant, I would say. The temperatures with the fan maxed out, and again, with the fans maxed out on this, the fans are so quite so small, really, I'd have to say, and they're not loud at all. You still couldn't hear it over the I.O., but we did improve uh, the cooling performance quite substantially. Now, when we'd overclocked the card, we got a GPU temperature uh, maxed out of 43 degrees C uh, and a hotspot of 70 degrees C. So basically, with the frequency or the speed, should I say, of the fans on the card maxed out, we had around 25% lower temperatures than we'd seen at stock. So with all this overclocking and the stability testing, like I say, it wasn't responding to voltage, but the card did respond to 
car frequency, it did respond to uh, fans, it did respond to power limit, and it did respond to uh, memory frequency. We now saw a maximum GPU boost frequency of 3,683 megahertz uh, on the core uh, and 2,732 megahertz on the memory. So quite a decent improvement on both of those clocks. So once I'd uh, ascertained that these were uh, stable for 24 seven use, then I obviously ran through all the benchmarks I like and nothing that you're bothered about. And what were the results of those? Well, they're gonna be on the screen now, but I'll also waffle on through them so it's not just a massive noise or a massive zero noise. Okay, Firestrike graphics score saw a 5% increase over stock. TimeSpy 4K, a 4.3% over stock. TimeSpy at 1440p, 4.2%. Port Royal 4K, 4%. Port Royal 1440p, 2.5%. Final Fantasy at 1080p, 2.6%. Final Fantasy at 4K, 2.6%. Superposition at 1080p with medium settings, 4.1%. Superposition 4K optimized settings, 5.2%. Unigen Valley, 5%. Luxpoint Mark, 8.4%. And Monster Hunter, 1.7%. So as you can see, uh, on all the benchmarks, we saw uh, at least a statistical improvement with a maximum improvement of up to 8.4% and an average improvement of around 4.1 to 4.5%. So having maxed out the overclocking on this card by purely normal style of overclocking, I then decided to explore undervolting or negative offset on the voltage, uh, just simply because on the 9070 XT card, we'd really uh, got good results out of using this method. So I wanted to see if it was the same on this particular card. Now, what I can report is I got no physically higher megahertz on the GPU slider in the driver or the memory slider in the driver by undervolting or use a negative offset. However, when I set the offset to a lower amount, so say minus 25 millivolts, minus 50 millivolts, and so on and so on, the actual peak frequency was going upwards. And that's obviously because of the power limit or more power limit being made available to the card to boost to when you're actually uh, using a negative offset. So what I found out now was that the, the sliders couldn't go any higher to remain stable through my uh, stability testing. But at minus 100 MV uh, on the offset, I got quite a higher frequency. And, and this was a higher frequency that remained higher for longer and thus gave me another benefit when running through my benchmarks. So this time by undervolting to minus 100 millivolts, which was the best this card could do, I still had a plus 200 on the core, but it resulted in a stable uh, GPU frequency uh, of 3,724 megahertz, which had gone up a solid 50 megahertz from uh, just overclocking. And I also observed uh, on the graphs within the software that it was hitting this frequency far more often than it was with just standard overclocking. And like I said, this is because of the power limit being made available more to the card more often of the time. And obviously, if you're under vaulting as well, uh, you tend to see slightly lower temperatures, again, which uh, with the algorithm built into the driver, gives you more uh, max frequency available while keeping the card stable. Uh, the memory overclock remained 2,733 megahertz on the memory. And I also actually tried at this point using the faster timings available to you in the driver uh, to tune the memory. And I noted that this actually maybe shaved an edge or two off stability, which would mean you need to clock down the memory to get it stable. And then the faster timings didn't really help. So for some people, I guess it's worth trying out faster timings to see if this will help you. And that's available just in the driver to get even more speed. But for me, it didn't. It, re it resulted negatively in having to downclock the memory, which it then resulted in the scores being exactly the same. So I went for a higher memory frequency with the timings as standard uh, for rock solid performance through my benchmarking suite and through my stability testing. Now, with undervolting, as I've said, uh, the GPU now boosted to 3,724 megahertz, so a higher boost frequency and for, for longer. The power draw, however, did go up on this to 203 watts, which is 8% more than stock. But the power draw is obviously 
in, in exactly correlated with the frequency uh, and, and obviously the cards remain stable at a higher frequency needle needs to draw more power so we can expect that. It's 8% more than stock that I said and, and obviously it's making pretty much zero difference to your electricity bills because I know a lot of you out there uh, will want to save every single penny that you can. Uh, temperatures on overclocked and under vaulted with everything absolutely maxed out was now uh, 43 degrees C with uh, 74 degrees C on the hotspot. So virtually no change in temperature whatsoever over overclocked. In fact, almost the exact same temperature to be honest. The GPU never got even one degree hotter. Uh, and again, with the, the fans maxed out on this, we saw around 25% lower temps than stock, showing that the, the fans are very efficient, even with the 203 watts new higher ceiling. So, after all that waffle, what was the actual scores of overclocking and undervolting on this particular card with these higher boost frequencies? Fire Strike uh, graphics score was now a 5.6% increase, times by at 4K, 7.7% uh, increase, times by at 1440p was a 7.6% increase, Port Royal at 4K was now an 8% increase, Port Royal at 1440p was now an 8% increase, Final Fantasy at 1080p was a 7% increase, Final Fantasy at 4K was an 8% increase, Superposition at 1080p was a 7.8% increase, Superposition at 4K was now a 7.8% increase, Unigen Valley at 1080p with all the settings maxed out was a 6.7% increase, Luxmark an 8.4% increase and finally Monster Hunter a 4.8% increase. So, the average increase now by overclocking and on to vaulting was 7.28%, so around 7.5%, uh, with this giving around 3% more performance uh, than overclocking alone. And as we can see there, pretty much every single test is now above a 5% increase, no matter what we did, uh, with the best uh, being 8.4%, but most of them, uh, especially the gaming style tests, now hovering actually around 8% in pro mode, which is really solid uh, free performance from overclocking any GPU. So, what's the 8-pack conclusion on this card? Well, this card is actually very good in 8-pack size. The 9060 XT represents better value for money per pound than the 9070 XT, which is already a class leader in the area of price to performance. So, well done to AMD for that. Also, the card's very tunable. You can overclock it, you can undervolt it, and everything's functional within the AMD drivers. So you don't have to install any third-party software to get the best out of it, and that's obviously gonna keep your OS and background software as light as possible for when you're actually gaming. And it's, for me, it was actually quite fun to find out what the best settings were for this particular card uh, when I was testing. And obviously that rips you the rewards when you're under vaulting and overclocking, a minimum of 5%, but all the way up to 8.4% of improvement. So it's well worth doing for free performance. A word on this Sapphire Pure card that I've got here. Obviously it's a very well designed cooler that was stable throughout all my testing uh, and, and the overall design fits well into most uh, systems. So well done again to Sapphire for that. Uh, and like I say, I was really impressed with how low noise the fans were putting out even when they cranked them up to, to overclock. So anyone who buys this card, you know, you can, can if you've got headphones on and you're gaming, know that you're not gonna really notice the GPU by smashing up the frequency on the fans to, to get the most out of your undervolting and your overclocking experience. This card as a whole is, again, also very good value for money around 350 quid. So get your wallets out and damage those credit cards. The card, uh, finally, as I've probably already said, is great for anyone gaming at 1080p, or very, very good for 1080p gaming, and also good at 1440p uh, for gaming too, especially with the 16 gigabyte of onboard memory. And finally, as always, do not like this video. Don't like our socials at Overclockers and certainly don't subscribe to anything that we do. But, as always, check out the guns on 8-pack and also another one of his great videos, well, not just great, probably the best on YouTube, on the 9070 XT. I think that's a pure version also by Sapphire.